Hi, I'm Dan Donaghy from the English department. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, there are some people uh, coming out to welcome Maria back to Eastern. Uh, just a, a little while ago, she finished doing a, a really great workshop with our writing poetry class. And uh, this is sort of part two of that day where we'll get to hear her, her read uh, her work for us tonight. Uh, some people to thank up front. I want to thank the English department's uh, visiting writers series, uh, English department chair, Barbara Liu, uh, the dean of arts and sciences, uh, Dr. Carmen Sid, as well as my colleagues in the English department for sponsoring this event. And I also want to thank, uh, she's not here uh, physically, but here in spirit, and that's Miranda Lau, the secretary in the English department, who is the glue to everything. Um, and she did so many little things to help with today's event, and it wouldn't have been possible without her. So, um, uh, and uh, as I said, I, I want to thank Maria for that, that wonderful workshop earlier with our students. Well, well, great prompts and a great, a really great experience. So, uh, and also while we're here, thank the Creative Writing Club. I see members of the Creative Writing Club here. That's great, uh, especially the eboard. Uh, President uh, Brooke Cochran and Vice President Allison Brown, uh, Secretary Haley Knox, and Treasurer soon to be President Justin Burek uh, for their support of this event and all other literary events that uh, we do here on campus. If you are interested in creative writing and you're looking for the club, that, that does such endeavors, you want to uh, become part of the Creative Writing Club. See how that goes together? It just, it just fits so naturally. And uh, what they're working on right now is putting together this year's Eastern Exposure, the Students Literary Magazine. Uh, and our date for that is May 2nd at, at 7. That's definite? Okay. And that'll be in the Student Center Theater, so you all should come out and, and check that out. But that's the year-long labor of love. If, if you're into editing, into working with visiting writers, inviting people, being part of coffee houses. And, and uh, we almost went to Tampa for the AWP, but we got snowed out. So it, uh, anyway, lots of good things going on in the, the, in the writing, uh, Creative Writing Club, and you all should be a part of it. Uh, some upcoming events. Next Tuesday in this room, is that four days from now? I'm bad, five, five days from now? <laughs> next, next Tuesday on the 10th, uh, there will be a gathering of Connecticut Poets Laureate from the various towns and counties around the state. Uh, it's, it's something to check out. Uh, I'll be reading for approximately six minutes, and you don't want to miss that. Uh, uh, or if you want to miss that, there will be about 54 minutes of other poets. So there's that. You know, either way, you win. In, 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 uh, when you think of it that way. Um, also coming up on Wednesday, April 18th at seven o'clock downtown. Those of you who venture down to Main Street and Willimantic. Uh, at the Wyndham Theater Guild, we're having a, a special event in honor and memory of a, a person who's really the, the cornerstone of, of a lot of poetry here in Willimantic, and that is Sandy Taylor, Alexander Sandy Taylor. He founded Curbstone Press. He's a, a wonderful poet in his own right, and he uh, worked as a translator, and he really worked um, all his life thinking about uh, for using literature to fight for, for human rights. And um, in his memory, we are celebrating the rich tradition of poetry in Wyndham. And some poets connected with Curbstone Press will be reading, and that'll be Doug Anderson, Steve Strait, and Alexandra, Alexandrina Sergio will be reading, as well as a bunch of high school students. I'm very excited. Been uh, visiting classes, doing, doing things with local high school kids, and, and that will really carry the evening is the energy of the, the high school students. So if you are interested in seeing what downtown is like, I know uh, students don't always go downtown, but there's a, a wonderful little hidden, hidden theater down there that is, that is uh, worth your attention. And um, also thank my wife Karen for donating to our, our box uh, of food. And we have some other donations there for uh, the uh, Covenant Soup Kitchen here in Willimantic, and those, will, those cans will be taken down there. Thanks to everyone who put anything in there. And now, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Maria Mazziati Gillen. Uh, if you've ever taken a creative writing class with me or have talked to somebody who has, probably you have, have heard the name Maria Mazziati Gillen. Uh, her book, Writing Poetry to Save Your Life, How to Find the Courage to Tell Your Stories, has helped and inspired my students for many years. Unlike many other textbooks that focus on the external concerns of a poem, spending a chapter going over all of the different kinds of metrical ways to construct a line or, or what the shell of different various forms of a sonnet look like. Um, Maria's book shows you how to let go, which is not easy, which we just did in the workshop, 
um, and do what you might have never done before. Uh, and that is right without filter and shame, right as a means of claiming your, the power of your voice and believing that your stories are worth telling. Uh, after writing for 20 minutes of, about one of the, one, the hundreds of prompts in Maria's book, you might have the raw material for a necessary, uh, terrific poem. You might even, if you let yourself go and don't tell yourself you couldn't, have written a powerful first draft of that poem. Maria's career is staggeringly impressive in a couple of ways. Um, one, I don't know that uh, anyone has ever done as much for uh, spreading the word and celebrating American poetry as Maria has done. I'll get to her books in a minute. <laughs> there are 22 of them. Um, but Maria, uh, in addition to being uh, the director of the creative writing program and a professor of poetry at Binghamton University, which is part of the SUNY system, uh, she is also the founder and executive director of the Poetry Center Passaic County Community College in Patterson, New Jersey. Patterson, her home city. Um, how far is the college from your childhood home? Like you said, five, ten minutes? It's just amazing. I mean, to have that link to, to where you come from and to, and to have this center that close to your childhood home that is really, it, it's a... Uh, it's, a repository for American poetry. Over for 38 years, she's hosted poets uh, from all over the United States, uh, the, the most famous, most wonderful poets. They come in, and not as what can happen when, when writers travel around, not just come in, do a reading, and leave. And come in, inviting people who are, are going to, to, whose work is going to relate to, to people in the audience, and also doing workshops with, with writers in the community, that it's not just poetry's up here and we're down here and we're just supposed to listen to these deified poets. It's, we're fellow poets. And for that, doing that alone is uh, a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, in addition, also happening in Patterson out of Passaic County Community College, Maria has edited the Patterson Literary Review, which just published its 46th issue. So um, as if that is not, so, so there she's a full-time professor and director of a graduate creative writing program. And she's the founder and director of one of the most impressive and important literary series in the United States. Uh, and has edited a, a prestigious poetry journal, a literary journal, through 46 issues. Uh, she has also, where's my script? <laughs> Uh, won a slew of awards before I get to the books. Uh, uh, she has uh, won the Chancellor's Award for Scholarship and Creative Endeavor from Binghamton University, the New Jersey Governor's Award for Literary Outreach, the May Sarton Award, uh, New Jersey State Council for the Arts Fellowships and Poetry, the American Literary Translators Association Award, and the Dare to Imagine Award from the Very Special Arts Organization. Um, and the, the award, and also a, a prestigious award from AWP, is that just for a, a life, lifetime work in literary outreach, is that? Um, which, so at this national convention, see the convention we're going to go to, which brings together writers and scholars and, and teachers from all over the United States, this was 2014. Maria was honored in front of the literary world as the person who is, is doing uh, outstanding work in community outreach. And you should just win it every year, honestly. I mean, who else is doing more from what I just listed, right? So to the books, and then we'll get Maria up here. Um, in addition to our lifetime of teaching and service, Maria has published 22 books of and about poetry, and with her daughter Jennifer Gillen, edited four anthologies. Her most recent books are the poetry and uh, photography collaboration with Mark Hillringhouse, Patterson Light and Shadow, which is available over there. So poems matching uh, photographs, that, that's there for your perusal and perhaps purchase at the end of the reading. Uh, what Blooms in Winter, um, a collection of poems, and also a collection of her poems side by side with some of her paintings, The Girls in the Chartreuse Jackets. Um, other books include What We Pass On, collected poems uh, 1980 to 2009, Ancestors Song, and the aforementioned uh, Writing Poetry to Save Your Life, How to Find the Courage to Tell Your Stories. So. Um, we could go on, but it's time for Maria. Uh, please join me in welcoming back to Eastern Maria Mazziati Gill. Okay. 
It's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, you certainly, the students here seem to me to be so amazing and wonderful. And part of it, I think, is you have wonderful teachers. But part of it is you're very talented and you're very brave. And that's what I saw in that class today, the bravery of the students and their willingness to take risks and to make themselves vulnerable. Uh, one of the things I think we have to do if we're going to write is we have to believe that the stories we have to tell are worth telling. And not only are they worth telling, but that we shouldn't be ashamed to tell them, that it's important for us to claim our space, to seize our power, to find our stories, and whatever they are, whatever your social class, whatever your ethnic background or racial background, there is a story that only you can tell. It took me a long time to find that out. I was trying to prove I wasn't just a poor immigrant kid uh, and who grew up in a cold water flat. I was trying to prove that. So I had all these poems with Greek gods in them, prove how intellectual I was. And then I was in graduate school. I went back to graduate school uh, when my children were getting a little older. And a graduate school professor said to me, it's in this poem about your father that you find the story you have to tell. And then I thought, well, maybe I can write about being a kid who didn't speak English when I went to school. Maybe I can write about being a wife, a mother, a daughter, a granddaughter, a grandmother, uh, an Italian-American, uh, a teacher. Maybe I can write about all those things and there's a place in American literature for me. And I'll tell you one other little story, and that is that uh, several years ago, I won a contest I, I, from, I think, the New England Poetry Society, I can't, I, New England Poetry Club. And one of the things as part of winning that contest, I think it was called the May Sarton Award, um, they had me go and read at Longfellow's uh, house on Bartle Street in uh, Cambridge. And I was so stupid, I didn't realize that these 18th and 19th century poets had to be very wealthy because obviously poor people were busy working in the factories or in the fields and they weren't running, writing poetry. And I got up there and it's now a national park and I looked at the house and I looked at the leather lined, the leather lined books and the leather lined study and the beautiful desk and the huge house and the, and the garage or maybe it was a barn originally that was bigger than like five times bigger than the apartment I grew up in. And I thought, oh, wait, all these people whose work I loved when I was in grammar school, they were all rich. It had never occurred to me until that moment that you really had to be rich if you were going to be a poet. Anyway, I want to read a poem uh, which took me until I was 50 to have the courage to write it. And I did this when I was 17. So sometimes shame follows us for a long time and guilt follows us for a long time and then finally we're able to write about something we did because we were kids and didn't understand what was really important. Daddy, we called you daddy when we talked to each other in the street, pulling on our American faces, shaping our lives in Patterson slang. Inside our house, we spoke a Southern Italian dialect mixed with English, and we called you Papa. But outside again, you became Daddy, and we spoke of you to our friends as my father. Imagine we were speaking of that father knows best TV character in his dark business suit, carrying his briefcase into his house, retreating to his paneled den, his big living room and dining room, his frilly aproned wife who greeted him at the door with a kiss such space and silence in that house. We lived in one big room, living room, dining room, kitchen, bedroom, all in one, dominated by the great oak dining table around which we sat talking and laughing, listening to your stories, your political arguments with your friends. Papa had glowed in company light, happy when the other immigrants came to you for help with their taxes or legal papers. It was only outside that glowing circle that I denied you, denied your long hours as night watchman at Royal Machine Shop. One night, 
Riding home from a date, my middle-class American boyfriend kissed me at the light. I looked up and met your eyes as you stood at the corner near Royal Machine. It was nearly midnight, January, cold and windy. You were waiting for the bus, the streetlight illuminating your face. I pretended I did not see you, let my boyfriend pull away, leaving you on the empty corner, waiting for the bus to take you home. You never mentioned it, never said that you knew how often I lied about what you did for a living or that I was ashamed to have my boyfriend see you find out about your second shift work, your broken English. Today, remembering that moment, still illuminated in my mind by the street lamp's gray light, I think of my own son and the distance between us greater than miles. Papa, silk worker, janitor, night watchman, immigrant Italian, better than any father. I am under the years you spent in menial work, slipping down the ladder as your body failed you while your mind so quick and sharp longed to escape. Honor the times you got out of bed after, after sleeping only an hour to take me to school or pick me up the warm bakery rolls you bought for me on the way home from the night shift, the letters you wrote to the editors of local newspapers. Papa, silk worker, janitor, night watchman, immigrant Italian, better than any father knows best father, bland as white rice, with your wine press in the cellar, with the newspapers you collected out of garbage piles to turn into money you bank for us, with your mouse traps, with your cracked and calloused hands, with your yellow teeth. Papa, dragging your dead leg through the factories of Patterson. I am outside the house now, shouting your name. And what I, what I really should say is that it took me a long time to be able to write that poem and a long time not to feel um, ashamed of my father or ashamed of myself for having been so completely irrationally stupid about the way I treated him and uh, by not understanding so much about what was important that I should have honored. And, and I have to say that my father really taught me how to reach out into the world. And I don't think I would have built the Poetry Center or the Binghamton Center for Writers or any of the other things that I did without my father's example of how he went out and he tried to help everybody, how he did income tax. He taught himself to, to fill out income tax forms by looking at that horrible income tax book. I mean, I have graduate degrees and I don't understand a word. And he taught himself to do English income tax for everybody by looking at that book and reading it. And he was so good at doing it that what ended up happening is um, uh, that when I took over doing my income tax when he was 86 and he said, I'm too old, um, I got audited. The first year I did it, I got audited. All the times that he did it, we never, we never got audited, but he would take people to, um, the consulate in Newark because they were afraid to go. He would take them to go s fill out the papers uh, to sell property in England, Italy or to send for their wives or their children. He would, uh, took it on himself to try to get these immigrant Italians to register to vote and to, uh, he'd drive them out to go vote and he really was committed to doing things to make the world a better place even though he didn't have three and a half cents. Um, anyway, I'm going to read a poem called What I Can't Face About Someone I Love. And this is a poem about my son who's a lawyer and an arch conservative. It's very hard for me to admit that because I don't know how anybody could grow up in my house and end up being an arch conservative. But somehow, my son is an arch conservative. So anyway, what I can't face about someone I love. That my son loves me, but would prefer not to see me too much. Every Sunday night, when I call him in North Carolina, where he lives with his wife and two children, I can hear the heaviness in his voice, his hello tempered with impatience, our conversation stiff and stilted. They always think I can talk to a stone. 
strangers in buses and trains tell me their life stories. Acquaintances tell me about their affairs and shattered marriages. Show me the secret undersides of their lives. My graduate students vie for my attention. They want to sit next to me and carry my bags and fetch my lunch. But my son can't wait to get off the phone with me. I ask him how the kids are or specific questions about school. I ask about his wife, his job. He answers with one or two words. They're fine or okay or the same. My son is a lawyer. He was always brilliant with language, at least written language, and he can read a 300-page book in an hour and remember every detail. But with me, he turns mute as a stump. If I ask for help with some legal problem, of course he will give it. But I do not hear in his voice the little I hear in my daughter's voice when I call her. Instead, I hear reluctance, as though his attention were focused on some truly fascinating person, and he can't wait to get off the phone. I tell stories that I hope will amuse him, but finally, after struggling and finding no response, I can't wait to hang up. I say, well, John, have a good week. Give everyone a hug for me. I know my son has divorced me, somewhere deep inside himself in a place he doesn't look at. I am too much for him, too loud, too dramatic, too frantic, too emotional. I laugh too much. I wear him out in a minute and a half. If he never saw me again, he wouldn't miss me. And this is what I can't face about someone I love. I read a lot about social class because I was poor as a kid, and there were so many things I didn't know and so many things I didn't understand about social class because unless you're raised in an upper middle class household, you really don't have the opportunity to know some things. I remember being invited by a boyfriend when I was in graduate school to go to his house in Scarsdale, and um, the maid felt sorry for me um, the maid, um, I could use a tissue. If I knew where they were, it would be great. Okay, I have it. Um, the maid brought out this silver sugar bowl, and it had little tongs. And I didn't know how to get the sugar cubes. I mean, I was struggling to get the sugar, and they were all looking at me, all staring at me like it was a creature from Mars. It was so horrible. It was a moment, and I finally said, no, thank you. <laughs> couldn't get them. It was hopeless. I couldn't get them. But that's not something you ever think you're going to have to know about. Um, anyway, uh, so this poem is called 90s, and I think they still have bridal showers, don't they? All right, well, there, were, there was a lot I didn't know about what was tacky and what wasn't. At my bridal shower, someone gave me a pink see-through nightgown and pink satin slippers with slender heels and feathers. The gown had feathers on it, too. I've always hated my legs, and even then, when I was still thin and in good shape, I didn't want to wear that nightgown or slippers, didn't want to parade in front of you like some pinup. But I wore them anyway, all those negligees I got as shower presents, sleazy nylon I didn't know was tacky. When I wore shorty nightgowns, I'd leap into bed, not wanting you to notice how the nightgown revealed what I thought my biggest flaw. In all the young years of our marriage, I wore a different nightgown every night, not that it ever stayed on for long. And afterwards, I'd pull it back on, afraid our children would find me naked in our bed. I felt so sophisticated in those nightgowns, like the ones Doris Day wore in movies. Only years later, when my daughter buys me a nightgown made of soft and blue, smooth blue silk, do I realize that the first ones I owned were cheap imitations of this, the one I hold now to my cheek. Grateful to have been once what I was. How lucky I am to have loved you in nylon, in silk, in my own incredible skin. I'm having some basic allergy attacks. You just got, I don't have a cold, honestly. <clears throat> but I do have a really bad, I'm having a really bad allergy to something. 
I, can't, I don't quite know what it is, but whatever it is, it's a real pain. Um, anyway, I'm going to read a poem about my mother. <clears throat> and my brother used to call my mother the little general. My brother called our mother the little general when we were teenagers, my brother driving the car, my mother sitting next to him, her head a small dark knob, barely reaching the top of the seat. My bossy mother who told us how to live our lives. <clears throat> my mother who was always moving. When I remember her, I see, almost, see her almost as a blur, like the cartoon of the roadrunner. My mother who washed all the dishes as soon as the last bite of food vanished from the plate. My mother who held my doctor brother's foot until he fell asleep when he was still a boy. My mother who sat at the kitchen table with us, always ready to hear the stories of our lives, ready to tell the story of hers. My mother who told me everything that was wrong with me. So I still hear her voice, but she says she told me for my own good. My mother who loved the feel of the earth on her hands, who smelled the flour and spices, who baked thousands of loaves of, of bread, cooked innumerable fragrant meals for her children and grandchildren in her basement kitchen. My mother who taught me how to laugh. My mother who could not read or write. And though she wanted to go to school, my father wouldn't let her. Women don't need to go to school, he said. My mother, who did not know how much money my father had in the bank and never wrote a check. My mother, who wanted to learn how to do everything. My mother, who could quote poems she memorized in third grade in Italy before she had to leave school. My mother, who drew an imaginary line around us to keep us close. The front stoop, our boundary, the family, our country. A little sturdy body better than any magic charm. My mother, whose skin turned orange before she died. Though the week before she got sick, she planted a huge garden. We were sure she was too powerful to die. Ma, even now, 20 years, <clears throat> excuse me, 20 years after the funeral procession led us to Calvary Cemetery and to the mausoleum drawer, we filed you in. I wish I could drive over to your house and find you there, your earthy humor, your warm arms that always were the place I call home. Uh, and I'm going to read a poem about my daughter. I'm glad she's not here. She wouldn't like it. Uh, <laughs> she'd be annoyed at me, I'm sure, but I still am going to do it. Um, and this poem is called, It's My Gillen Pot Roast. Okay, wait a second. I have to find it, make sure I have the right book. One of the problems with having so many books is sometimes you write down the wrong, uh, you, and that's exactly what I did, wrote down the wrong pain because it's in this book, not that one. Okay, wait. Sorry, guys. I, I'm going to have to give up if I can't find it quickly. I know it's here. I so carefully put these, these um, little stickums in, but that's you much good if you don't know which bo book you're in. That doesn't, doesn't help very much. Oh, come on. Where are you? Where are you? Oh, here it is. It's my Gillen pot roast. My daughter is working on her book, <clears throat> which was due at the publishers weeks ago. She has not slept in days. She tells me, I'm a Gillen. Remember Grandma and how she'd start getting ready to cook a pot roast at 8 a.m. and by 5 p.m. she still wouldn't be finished. That's what I'm like with this book. It's my Gillen pot roast. We both laugh, but I hear the desperation in her voice. I dig out my mother's rosary, begging God to send her the energy and inspiration to find her way to the end of this book. I haven't been to church in years. I don't know God, why God would listen to my prayers, but for my daughter, I am willing to try anything. I promise all sorts of things if only God will help us, get, help, help her get the book finished so she can move on with her life. Every day I call her, every day she is not finished. I tell her I am praying. I can tell she's encouraged. When, when more days go by, she tells me, forget it, I don't need a prayer, I need a miracle. I wanna say it's a scholarly book. Three people will read it. Why are you worrying, just forget it. Instead she says, you would have finished it months ago. You're a Masiati. This is my pot roast. I have to cook it the Gillen way. Okay. And let me 
see. Bell bottoms and plast platform shoes. A friend sends me a picture of herself from the 70s, bell bottoms, platform shoes, a patterned button down shirt, hair puffed up from a perm. I can see the outline of the person she is now. And she reminds me of myself in the 70s, married for eight men, eight years to a man. <clears throat> I knew I loved the moment I saw him. Two children who seemed to me to be exquisitely beautiful because they look like my husband and not me. The picture reminds me of all those evenings when I dressed in bell bottoms and silky patterned shirts and shoes with chunky heels. Those evenings we'd invite friends over for drinks and conversation, our children asleep upstairs. Those clothes, the perm I got because I wanted to look cool, though my hair was already kinky, so the perm made me look as if I'd stuck my finger in a light socket. I look at the picture of us from that time, Dennis and I standing at the t together at the head of the dining room table, friends seated around us. Dennis's face is flushed, his eyes shining. I wonder if he is tipsy. He is wearing a fiddled shirt with little flowers on it. I am grinning and looking up at him. I might as well be wearing a neon sign that says, I love you. Looking back at us, I would like to tell my younger self, look how fortunate you are. The man you love beside you, your children sleeping in their safe beds, your friends around you. Listen, be grateful for the moments caught in these photographs. The world full of possibility, the sky not yet darkened. Okay, just a second here. Oh no, you don't want, I think God, I see you have, you have this book over there, right? Okay, but I better keep reading from it then. <laughs> I mean, it's always good to sell books if possibly can. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to read a poem. Why I love the library. My mother, who never wanted me to leave the front stoop, let me go to the Riverside branch of the Patterson Public Library. Each week I'd climb the steep hill, past the houses larger and much nicer than ours, huge two-family houses with big sun porches. I'd open the door into the library and it was like stepping into another land, the one full of quiet, soft muted colors of the book covers, the well-worn pages, the hours in the children's section, the chairs, the perfect size for me. Christine, the library librarian, always welcomed me as though I were an old friend. We spoke Italian at home, and we had a set of encyclopedias that my mother bought on time from a door-to-door -door salesman, a set, set that my brother read all the way through. But when I was eight, my sister got a book of, Gr of Grimm's fairy tales for a birthday present, and she, like my brother, was very practical and scientific and uninterested in fairy tales. I loved that book, and once I had read it, I wanted more, so I talked my mother into letting me go to the library and enter that magical kingdom where I could spend an hour surrounded by books, choose my books by starting at A and working my way around the shelves. When I was 11, Christine said, okay, you can move into the adult section now. I can still see the sunlight pouring through the large windows, the exquisite stillness of the room the power that books possessed to make me feel warm and safe in the same way a bowl of pasta and chicken soup make me feel comfortable even today, all these years beyond childhood. And then I rushed home down the hill, clutching my seven books for the week, all, the tr all that treasure I carried in my arms. I was swear, I was so happy, my feet didn't touch the ground. Um, and I'm going to read a, book, a poem from, um, and my, my book is called The Girls in the Chartreuse Jackets, and it's my drawings, and I mean, I have never had an art class, so these are very interesting, unusual, and perhaps not very good art, but, they're, but I've had a wonderful time with them, and I'm so glad I started painting again, I, because it feels so 
good to find another part of my brain that is very different from the part I use when I'm writing. And, and, and it just seems to me to be such a blessing to have found this. And I have to say that it was Diane de Prima who talked me into painting again. I mean, I didn't think I would ever paint again, but um, she really got me to do it. And uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful thing for me. And if I could find the uh, poem that I want, that would be really good. Um, I know it's here, and I thought I had marked it, but of course, now I can't find it. Um, I want to read this poem called The Girls in the Chartreuse Jackets. Um, and uh, the publisher of this chased me around for about a year and a half. I thought he was crazy. He wanted to do a book of my poems and, um, and, and my paintings. And I thought, Wait, you know, I, I never had an art class. How can I possibly pi publish a book with my paintings in it? And, and it's, it's been great fun to do this, I have to say. Um, and why can't I find that poem? I don't know where it could have possibly have gone. Um, oh, here it is, because I forgot it wasn't called the girls. It's called in seventh grade. In seventh grade, I wanted desperately to buy a chartreuse sack and jacket that all the cool girls in the class had. I thought those jackets were beautiful, so shiny and soft in that wide color that was so popular that year. My mother said, no, you don't need that junk. And looking back, I see how cheap and sleazy those jackets were, how that color would have made my olive-toned skin look jaundiced. But then I fell asleep dreaming my mother bought me that jacket, and I'd slide my arms into the sleeves, and miraculously, I would become one of the cool girls, the girls who stood around on Patterson Street cor corners with boys in black leather jackets, the girls who would be the first to be kissed, the first to go out on a date, the first to wear a boy's ring on a chain around their neck, and not someone like me, shy, inarticulate, introverted, unable to find even one word to say to the boys in the class who treated me as though I were breakable, something in my big eyes and obvious innocence that made them want to protect me. In seventh grade, I wanted to be sexy and to have that quality some girls had that drew boys to them like bees to honey. The musk my friend still has where men flirt with her and her whole body changes when she talks to them. So seventh grade is an old memory in black and white. Some part of that child remains, wanting a pill that could transform me while the other part of me the one that races through my life like the roadrunner, the one who has long since left the 17th Street tenement behind, knows I would not trade the woman I have become for all the shiny chartreuse jackets in the world. And uh, if I can, I'd like to try a couple of new poems out on you. Um, and one is called Meat Fo Meatloaf and Hamburger Helpers. Hamburger Helper, excuse me. Growing up, my mother cooked macaroni and gravy, meatballs and brajol, spinach and potatoes, lentil soup, roasted chicken and potatoes, made zeppoli, big salads fresh from the garden, zucchini with rosemary, meals so delicious I can still taste them. Though my mother has been dead now for more than 20 years. When my children were growing up, my mother-in-law taught me how to make American food that my husband liked because he grew up on it. So I learned how to make pot roasts and leg of lamb and stew and roast beef, pork chops and steak and baked potatoes. She taught me how to make meatloaf, which was cheap and could be used for one meal plus sandwiches. She taught me to make meals with hamburger helper, which my mother called junk. Years later, my stomach turns at the thought of Hamburger Helper, the greasy feel of it, the fake chemical taste of sauce and spices, flavor created in a lab. But when I served those meals so different from anything my mother ever cooked, I felt I had arrived in middle-class America, that I now belonged in the land that almost guaranteed you'd die of a heart attack before you could reach old age, and not the land of my father too poor to buy all that meat, even if he had wanted to. My father, who died at 92, sitting in the sun in his garden, the aroma of tomatoes and peppers and zucchini perfuming the air around him. <laughs> 
Frank Sinatra's voice on the jukebox sings My Funny Valentine in the basement student union at Seton Hall University. I am 17, naive, awkward, unsure. I have a crust on Joey Kay, who is five foot 10 and skinny, all knees and elbows. Joey Kay is energy and motion. He has a domineering mother who insists he must marry a Greek girl. Joey is as naive as I am. We both edit the school newspaper. I really like it, not because I like journalism, but because it gives me a chance to spend time with Joey in the school newspaper office. The editor gives us, editing gives us something to talk about, relieves the awkward tension between us. I love his thatch of black hair, his eyes small and round as shoe buttons, his black horn rim glasses. I am attracted to him because he looks so fragile. Freshman year, he takes me to the Christmas dance. He must have asked me. I was too shy to have asked him. I bought a dress, cherry red, and fitted at the bodice, but with a flared skirt. We rode to the, drove to the dance in Bobby T's father's Buick, the size of a boat. Joey Kay and I sat in the back seat. He did not touch me. I did not touch him. He was no one's idea of a valentine, but to me, he was my funny valentine. And the song fit his awkward movements perfectly, fit that moment in time. The big back seat of the car, Jody's arm finally around me on the way home, his slim lips pressed hard against mine. I was glad he kissed me, but I felt nothing except his lips were pressing on mine. And I didn't know enough to understand that a kiss should be more than this. There was no spark at all, but I so needed to be loved, so needed to have someone's arms around me. I did not realize that Joey Kay was only my funny valentine in my mind, my heart and body unmoved by him. And I, I'm gonna finish with a poem, uh, which is both a poem about how we're ruining the world, and also a poem about my husband who got early onset Parkinson's disease. Um, and the same week of the, um, Bingham t uh, of the oil spill, uh, BP oil spill, was the week that my husband uh, died. And uh, so I couldn't really write about my husband's death I, and so I was only able to write about it only by mixing with it uh, my grief over uh, the, the BP oil spill and how we were destroying the world. We were so careless and greedy. Watching the pelican die. On TV, I watched the pelican with its mouth wide open, its wings and body coated with oil. Is it screaming? I do not know. I do not hear the sound, and since this is a photograph, I don't know if it was caught in that mouse-stretched howl when it died, or if it's howling in recognition that it cannot survive the thick coat of oil that bears it down. The ladies who take care of you while I'm gone say you were having trouble. His hands, they say, his hands. When I come home, I see your hands have turned black at the tips, the ends of your fingers eaten away. I watch the dead bird on the, in the gulf, floating on top of the water, its legs stiff and straight in the air, its body drained of all motion, all light. The next day I take you to the doctor. He tells me you will have to operate to remove the gangrenous flesh. The announcer on CNN says BP didn't want the photographer to take pictures of the dying birds covered as they are with the black slick of oil. They were hoping, he says, the birds would sink and the evidence will be swallowed by the ocean. And late afternoon, I hear my daughter cry out. I rush to see what's happened, and you are stretched out on the bed. Your body's so thin, you look like a boy. You do not move. I call 911, and the ambulance takes you to the hospital. BP is trying to put a cap on the spewing oil rig. CEO keeps saying, it's no problem. Clumps of oil wash ashore and float on the surface of the water. The beach is littered with dead fish and birds. At the hospital, they want to know whether we want extraordinary measures. No, I say, he has a living will. We hover around while they admit you, you have forgotten how to speak. Mostly, we lying in bed, staring into a space above our heads. In my mind, I see that screaming bird, its mouth wide open, a picture of torment and despair. 
I reach out to hold your hand, stroke your forehead. Dennis, I call out, Dennis, you do not hear. The doctor comes in to see you. Well, he says, he should have been dead five years ago. What did you expect? You shouldn't have taken such good care of him. We did everything we could, the BP president says, looking directly at the camera. It's not such a, such a calamity. We don't need to stop deep water drilling. Our economy will collapse if we do. We stand around your hospital bed. My brother comes in and says he'll try a stronger antibiotic. He, it's bad, he tells me, but he waits until we're in the hall to say it. The social worker tells me, you should put him in a nursing home. My brother tells me, if you kept him home all this time, if he gets a little stronger, I'll let him go home and he'll be around the things he knows. Another doctor comes in and says he's not going to make it. The social worker admonishes, admonishes us with her bag of common sense. She does not love you. We take you home. I sit next to you and hold your hand. The MSNBC reporter stands on the beach in a hurricane and picks up a huge glob of oil with a stick. Look, she says, look, and drips the oil on the white sand. She's shaking with fury at such destruction. Dead birds float by behind her. I'm in so much pain, you say, that you have not complained before. We feed you a jar of baby applesauce. You open your mouth and accept the food. When I see the pelican on TV with his mouth wide open in horror, I remember you as you lay dying. On the gulf, the earth and the sea are being destroyed, just as you were by the disease that finally defeated you after you struggled against it for all those years. Some things are bigger than all of us. We cannot defeat them. If there is enough carelessness and greed in the world, even the ocean can be destroyed. And you who fought against this illness to such courage, even you cannot survive. The blackened tips of your fingers, the oil heavy on the bird's feathers, the birds dead and floating on the surface that gradually sink and disappear.